Okay, so we are continuing. This is the second class of um, Megillat Esther um, with the year uh, 5781 or 2021. And um, last week, we spoke about some of the historical context for Megillat Esther, and I placed it in history in a very specific manner so that you understand that the story of Ahasuerosh is an actual historical event and not just some mythology. That's really important. Um, and today I want to continue uh, speaking about the Megillah and I want to get into more details. I want to actually read some of the Pesukim of Megillah Esther. So that's my, that's my goal today. But again, just to um, you know, bring everybody up to speed, the, the story of Purim takes place in the Persian Empire the Persian Median Empire around the year 450 um, before the Common Era. Um, and you know the story, there's a man, his name is Haman. Um, this Haman is an anti-Semite. He hates Jews, he can't stand them. Um, he particularly despises a Jew called Mordechai. Mordechai refuses to bow down and to submit himself before Haman. Part of being a good citizen in the Persian Empire, part of being a good citizen in almost all of the great empires was in the communist empire, um, communism, I'm sorry, Soviet Union, it was called the Soviet Union, it wasn't really an empire, um, in, in, in Nazi Germany and all dictatorships in North Korea, is to submit yourself before the ruling class. And Mordechai refuses to submit himself before Haman, um, the viceroy of the king, and Haman understands it. He gets it. He understands that this Jew um, has a higher authority, a higher, not just religious authority, because we're not just a religion, we are a nation under God. And we consider that ourselves to be a political authority. So he, Haman, cannot take it as any good Amalekite. He wants to eradicate the Jewish people, people because the Amalekites represent the aristocracy of the Goyim, those Goyim who believe that they should be treated like gods. They should tell people what to do. They should tell people what to think. They should tell people um, um, what to use for heating. And if it's windmills that freeze in the cold and then they all freeze to death because of global warming, that's what the ruling class said. And if you question that, there is something wrong with you questioning that, right? So that's Haman. Amalek represents the epitome of that way of thinking. Amalek represents those goyim who will not have it, that Jews say, wait, wait we, don't, we don't want to accept we're not going to submit ourselves to you. We're not going to submit ourselves intellectually. We're not going to sub submit ourselves politically. We're, we're going to be good citizens. We always were throughout history. Jews were the best citizens, but we're not going to submit ourselves. We're not going to enslave our minds. So that's the way the story is set up. You have Haman on the one side who represents Amalek. You have Mordechai on the other side who represents the nobility of the Jewish people. And Haman despises Mordechai. He wants to kill Mordechai, but more importantly, he wants to kill the Jewish people because he understands that Mordechai represents the intellectual elite of the Jewish people. This is actually the way the Jews think. We do not submit ourselves before men. Um, and um, you remember that there's a series of coincidences. Um, so there's a series of coincidences that take place uh, the white. Rob, can, I, can I interrupt you? I'm sorry. It was just something you said earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel bad. I'm. I, I no, shouldn't no, no. Have, Go ahead. Sorry. You said something that I, I felt I of a little more clarification. You said that you gave the historical background so that you don't see the story as mythology. And can you? elaborate I, I just I really want to understand what you're speaking to and what you feel maybe you know maybe the way it's taught else in general and so on and how we understand this right. yeah no that's that's okay because there is a movement among um, uh, um, among the Gentile nations among the uh, secular Jews let's call them to delegitimize the Bible 
Uh, that's been going on for well over you know a century, century and a half since uh, it started in the University of Berlin with the Wiesenschaft des Studentum and the biblical criticism. Um, and one of the things I like doing when I study the Bible is I like showing that it's actually history and it's like tough luck if you you know if you want to ignore facts, ignore facts at, at your own intellectual peril. So I really think it's important, you know, to highlight um, the historicity of the Bible, right? I mean, I can't do that with everything, you know. It doesn't matter to me actually. I really don't care because, you know, like for me, the Bible itself is a is is this test a text that should be relied on for his, history. Why not? Why do we rely on Herodotus? If Herodotus says something, oh, Herodotus said that it must be true. If CNN says something, oh, it must be true. But if the Bible says something, well, you know, do you have something, you, you know, I don't know. Like, no, it's probably not true because Herodotus didn't say it. So, so sometimes we can actually show, well, history, even Gentile history um, confirms the historicity of the story. And I like saying that because so often we have it the other way. You understand? That's why. Beautiful. Okay. But that's, yeah. So continuing now. So uh, what I want to do is before getting to the significance, maybe I'll, I'll do with this deal with the significance of Megillah Testen and what the B. Moshe Almos Nino, who we spoke about last week, he says, he talks about the significance of Megillah Testen. Uh, there, there is some great significance to it. But you know what? I want to just look at some of the Pesukim because I'm concerned that I'll talk so much about the Megillah that we won't actually read any Pesukim. So here's what I want to do. I want to look at the Pesukim and Megillah Testen, start with that, and then I'll go back and talk to you about you know, the, the more global um, meaning of the Megillah. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read for you the, the Pesukim um, and I'm gonna explain them and I will give you some of the details about the story in the course of, 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 of reading the Pesukim. So interesting, the, the story starts as follows. It starts, Ahashverosh. This story takes place in the days of Xerxes. Um, there's a word missing in the Pasuk. I'm gonna read it again. Vayhi, the story, takes takes place bimeh Ahashverosh in the days of Xerxes. And then it continues. It says, Hu Ahashverosh. We're talking about Xerxes, who ruled from Hamolech Mehodu Ve'ad Kush. He ruled from the Indian subcontinent, all the, that's all the way in the uh, east, all the way, all of, um, you know, uh, Persia, all of um, uh, Iraq, modern day Persia, Iran, uh, all of Iraq, all the way, to um, the east coast of Africa, to Ethiopia, um, what today is Ethiopia, um, and Egypt. What, what word is missing here? So for example, I'm telling you a story about Biden. So I said it happened in the days of Biden. What was it? Ah, that's right. He's supposed to say President Biden. In the days of President Biden, this happened. So what's missing in this pasuk is, it says that this happened in the days of Xerxes. Right, which Xerxes? Because apparently there might have been a few um, kings by the name of uh, Xerxes. He's saying this is the great Xerxes, right? There is Cyrus the Great, there is Darius the Great, and there is the great Xerxes Ahasuerus, who ruled this huge, huge, incredible swath of land. Never before was there an empire that controlled so much land um, as the Persian Empire did in the days of Ahasuerus. Okay. But you notice that it doesn't say Melech Ahashverosh. I'm going to explain that. I will explain why it doesn't say Melech Ahashverosh. It does say Hamolech Mehodu Be'at Kush. It does say he ruled over that huge swath of land, Sheva Ve'esrimu Me'a Medina. And this swath of land um, included 127 Medinot. You know what Medinot means? What the word Medina means? Does anyone know what the word Medina means? Province? Right. So people, right, in modern Hebrew, Medina means state. Um, you would also say that perhaps the word Medina more correctly means province. Um, the word Medina actually means cities. And this is the way I understand this pasuk. The, the word Medina means cities. For example, in Hebrew, I'm talking modern Hebrew, Medina, Medina means a, a state, but put modern Hebrew on the side. I'm not doing modern Hebrew, but in Arabic, in Arabic, the word Med, uh, uh, like Medina, the, 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 the city of Medina is the city, right? That's why it's called Med, Med, Medina, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm uh, explaining that to you. So you see that in the ancient Hebrew, the word Medina meant city. So probably each province 
in the kingdom of Ahasuerus had a main city, right? Had a metropolis in that province because there weren't there were many many keparim. There were many many areas which were undeveloped. There were many many places which were more like villages, right? But each province, let me just uh, right. Each province had a main city to it that was like the let's say the capital of New York State is uh, Albany, right? And so on. So these were the main cities. So it was Mea Sheva Ve Esrim Umea Medina. Okay, let's understand the Pasuk a little more clearly. It says, Bayamim Hahem. In these days, Keshevet Hamelech Hashverosh Al Kisem Al Futo. As King Xerxes was about to sit down or was finally settling down or sitting down, literally sitting down on his throne. Okay, what's happening here? What does it mean as he sat down on his throne? I mean, he sat down on his throne in the first year of his kingdom, but it says, no, it says, it says it was in the third year of his kingdom, he did the party. Now that's a little weird, right? So this is important. I'm wanting to, to be sensitive to language. That's really important because when, when you read the text, this is a written text. Um, when the when the, when the um, Nevi'im uh, wrote their words and these words became part of the Bible, there was incredible precision in the words. So every word is incredibly precise. So Keshevet HaMelech HaChashverosh means as the king was sitting down on his throne, because it was only in the third year that Ahasuerus sat down on the throne. Allow me to explain. Ahasuerus was not a descendant of Cyrus the Great, nor was he a descendant of Darius uh, the Great, right? Um, a Cambyses and uh, Pseudos Mercies. Um, who were the um, kings right before Ahasuerus? They were, but those two were descendants of Cyrus, uh, for example. So Ahasuerus got power because he was a great general. He was a powerful general. And what happened is that um, there was, as I mentioned last week, there was a re- uh, there was a rebellion in Egypt and also in Syria. So as Ahasuerus got power, the first thing he did was. Well, you would say the first thing he does is he has a great inauguration and a party, and he goes to the uh, the White House and he looks at the uh, you know furniture. And no, that's not what he did, because it was that um, rebellion which threatened to chop down the empire significantly. So what he did was he went to war, and he subdued the rebellion, and it took him two years to subdue the rebellion. So when the Pasuk says, Keshevet HaMelech HaChashverosh, this is when King HaChashverosh finally got to sit down on his throne. That is very precise. That's a very precise sentence because for the first two years, he didn't sit down on his throne, okay? So now we can also understand something else about what's happening. So this king wasn't really a king at first because he wasn't from the... Um, from the dynasty, right? He wasn't the descendant of one of the kings, but he was a great general. And that's why he's referred to as Ahasuerus. Because when does he actually finally become King Ahasuerus, who's respected and who's acknowledged as the king? When he subdues those rebellions and he returns to Persia as a victorious king and he enters the palace and you know what he does? Okay, if you were um, <laughs> uh, if you were King Ahasuerus, and the first two years you, there was no party, there was no inauguration, there was nobody uh, to sing "My Country Tis of Thee" or whatever they sing in inaugurations. And actually, I'm sorry, they probably sing the uh, Star Spangled Banner. Nobody to sing the Star Spangled Banner, nothing like that. What do you do? You come back to the palace, and you have the huge inaugural ball. That's how the story starts. It's really simple. What does he do? It is the third year of his kingdom when he finally sat down on his throne. 
Asa mishte lechol sarab ba'avadav. He says, now is the time to have this huge inaugural ball in my honor. Okay. Now, um, okay, we're going to talk about that party. We're going to talk about that party in a minute. But before we talk about the party, I want to point out something about the term that we looked at. We said, Keshevet HaMelech HaChashverosh, as HaChashverosh was sitting down, Al Kisem Al-Chuto, on the throne. Where was the throne? Beshushan Habira. Okay. It doesn't say Ba'ir Shushan. It doesn't say in the city of Susa. There is a city today in modern day um, uh, Iran, which is called Susa. I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. I think it's Susa or Shusha, but uh, whatever the uh, pronunciation in the Megillah, it's called Shushan. But it doesn't say Ha'ir Shushan. It says Shushan Habira. What's the difference between Ha'ir Shushan, the city of Susa, and Shushan Habira? Anybody know? It is as follows. This I learned from Rabbi Abraham Ibn Ezra. Ibn Ezra explains that the word bira means a palace, but it's not any palace. It's a palace that is built like a fortress. That's what Rabbi Abraham Ibn Ezra says. Interesting. They made excavations in modern day uh, Susa, um, where Shushan, the city of Shushan was actually there. And they found that outside the city, there was a hilltop. And on top of the hilltop was built the palace of the king. And the palace of the king was built on this hilltop like a fortress. And this was kind of a mini city. It was like a mini city inside within the walls of the fortress. There was a mini city. Other people lived inside that fortress, right? Uh, businessmen, aristocracy. They were in the fortress, and the purpose of that fortress was to protect the king, because as you know, um, there was a lot of assassinations and assassinations of assassins, and uh, the kings were always afraid for their lives. Um, and you remember how Belshazzar died, Belshazzar himself, who was a king of um, the last king of the Babylonian empire, the one who saw the writing on the wall, right? Um, he died because they broke into the palace, right? So this was a big concern especially for a person like Ahasuerus, who was not legitimately from the royal dynasty, right? He didn't have royal blood running through his veins and he needed to protect himself. So he had this fortress outside the city of Shushan and that fortress is called Shushan Habira, the fortress of Shushan. And that's where he has his huge, I mean, it's an incredible, you know, if you can think of, you know, um, Buckingham Palace, but maybe not even. I think there's a place in in France called Versailles or something. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, you, I, I'm just yeah, there is yeah. Right, I'm sorry about that. So I'm getting a message, your internet connection is, is, is unstable. Uh, but now I see um, that it's back. So there's a place in France, an incredible place. I, I never went to France. I'm just not embarrassed to say that. I, you know, I guess maybe there's something, maybe something wrong with me, I don't know. But there's a place called Versailles in France. Yeah, yeah. Right, and what is that, like a huge estate, something incredible? Yeah, that's, yeah, an estate, that's a good way to put it, yeah. Right, and yeah. I, so I'm, I'm, so I'm assuming that Ahasuerus had something incredible like that, and it was. We're going to read a little about, uh, we're going to read a little more about that. Okay, um, so now you know what Shushan Abira is. All right, and now you know when this takes place. Um, and let me explain to you a little about this inaugural ball because there's a lot of things that people misunderstand about this, um, about this party. So. Um, Let's, what did he do? Asa mishteh. What does the word mishteh mean? Mishteh means a party, but it doesn't really mean a party. The word mishteh comes from lashon lishtot, the drink. So let me tell you, in Persian culture, drinking 
was considered even more important than eating. So if you invited somebody to the party, it's not that you wouldn't give them food. Of course, you would give them food. People need to eat, but they would eat um, and they would actually stuff themselves. And But then they would drink. They would indulge in excessive drinking, right? So this was one of those sumptuous bowls, which involved a huge amount of uh, a huge amount of uh, alcohol, all you can drink. And um, it's something interesting. I want to tell you that in this Megillat Esther, there's many cases of drinking. Everybody seems to be drunk all the time. Um, it's kind of funny that when we celebrate Purim, during Sudat Purim, we're supposed to drink. We're not supposed to get drunk. You know that, right? It's, it's, it's forbidden. Uh, it's forbidden a point to get drunk. Um, that's important. I mean, I know that there's like some of the, there are certain elements in, uh, you know, in among the Jewish people that they think that Purim is a good time to pretend like you're an Irish drunkard, you know, to start drinking excessively, act violently, um, vomit in public, you know, and do other obscene uh, things. Actually, that's a horrible avera. It's a terrible avon to do that. And it's against the halacha, it's against the Torah. But but there is a misvah to drink, to drink, to drink to an extent where you're happy, you're in a good mood, and you fall asleep, as Anambam says. Uh, Anambam says you should drink enough so that you get, you know, you're, you're, it puts you in a good mood, it relaxes you, as good wine should. You know, everybody knows what it takes. Some people one cup of wine, other people two cups of wine, whatever it is, um, and then you fall asleep. So that's because in in, in the Megillah, everybody is always drinking. Uh, why was that? Why is it that everybody is always drinking? And here's the thing, the government is, you see how, you see how the Megillah, everything is accurate. I keep saying this, Nathan, you asked me the question before and I'm saying it again. It's important to understand the historicity of our text. So it's actually a fact mm. that in the ancient Persian empire, when the government would debate something, it was the general practice if it was something important, they're debating something important, to debate the matter when they were drunk, the government ministers would first sit down and get stone drunk, and they would debate the matter and reach a decision. The next day, when they were sober, they would review the decision they made the night before, when they were under the influence <laughs> of alcohol, and make a final decision. Um, what we decided to do when we were drunk is it does it really seem like a good idea? As good as it sounds, you know, sometimes it, something seems really good at night, and then the next day you wake up and you're like, man, that was a terrible idea. So, so they would do that. They would first deliberate upon something when they were drunk. They would have the debates, the back and forth, and then the next day they would make a final. Uh, they would make a final decision. Uh, this is actually brought in Herodotus. And let me see if I can find where in Herodotus. If you give me a moment, I think I'm just looking for the page. Hold on one second. One second, please. Because it really is a fascinating, um, no, darn it. Ah, I think I have it here. It was really, interesting. I thought I had it. I thought I saved it. But I guess I didn't. Okay, but Herodotus, oh yeah, I found it. So this is how Herodotus describes, <laughs> this is how Herodotus describes the Persians. I'm actually reading from Herodotus now. It is also their general practice to deliberate upon affairs of weight when they are drunk. And then on the morrow, when they are sober, the decision to which they came the night before is put before them by the master of the house in which it was made. And if it is then approved of, they act on it. If not, they set it aside. Um, sometimes, however, they are sober at their first deliberation. <laughs> but in this case, they always reconsider the matter under the influence of wine. In the sense of 
He's supposed to be drunk when you make a decision. But the Avad, if you were sober the first time, you can get drunk later on to make up for the fact that you were sober the first time. So that's the, um, hold on one second. So that's an actual, that is an actual historical description of the Persians. And it's an incredible fact. So now we understand why they're always having these parties, um, why they're always having these parties with, with wine and with excessive wine or alcohol, because that was the way that they made their decisions, okay? So that's important. So now you so, so now you see that they had this sumptuous party for 180 days, and you're like, uh, well, what's happening in the party? Well, um, let's see who in the who was in the party, and then you'll understand what's happening in the party. Okay. So let's let me tell you who was in the party. So it was a 180 day party. I'm going to explain why it was 180 days in a moment, and you're going to see that it's not the way you always understood 180 days. But first, let's see who was in the party. First of all, it was Hail. First of all, it was the army of the Persian Median Empire. This army is what brought Ahasuerosh into power. That's first of all. Next, Hapartemim. Hapartemim means the aristocracy, the nobility, the various lords, the various wealthy people, the people who finance, um, the people who finance the king. So that's next. And finally, and finally, he invited the governors of the different provinces because the way the Persian Empire worked actually was different than the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonian Empire was a highly centralized government where the king, you know, let's say the emperor, let's say it was Nebuchadnezzar, he ruled with an iron hand, with an iron fist, and he was in charge of everything directly. And there was no room for, for insubordination and people were terrified of him. The Persians actually were quite kind. That Well, kind, I mean, you know, um, I use that term loosely. Um, <laughs> kind relative to what? Uh, but they were kind in the sense that basically the Persians had a very decentralized government where they had different governors ruling different provinces. And those governors, they were able to make some money, meaning they were able to tax the people. They had to give some tax revenue back to the central government. They were able to keep some money for themselves, um, right? So that's the way the that's the way it worked. So they had a hundred. So all these sarim, all these governors, they were invited to the party as well. So let's summarize: the army first, the nobility, the aristocracy second, the governors third. Here you see the way Achashverosh thinks. What's most important to Achashverosh? His army, right? What's second most important to Ahasuerus? Those who finance him, those who finance the army, those who finance the uh, um, um, Ahasuerus personally. Um, one of them was, for example, Haman. Haman was one of these um, people, right? He was incredibly wealthy. And finally, the Sareh Medino. So this is the order of priority. Now, what was um, the length of the party? It was Yamim Rabim. It was a very long party, it lasted 180 days. That's one heck of an inaugural ball um, to be holding, right? So let me explain why it was so long. Um, we're talking about a huge empire here. Now, there's no way that a Hashverosh can invite all of the army and all of the generals and all of the nobility, right? And all of the governors in, in one shot. It can't be done. So my father, my father Allah Shalom, explained that this was a rolling party. First, he would invite, you know, you know, people, anybody with the last name A. I'm, I'm making this up. Obviously, it was organized differently, but you know, you know, all of the people from that particular part of the army, then the other part of the army, then people from that province, and people from that province. You understand? And in this way, the party was ongoing, and he had the ability to invite everybody to the party, but it took six months to do so. So you understand why it was a six month party. It wasn't like for six months, you know, the Persian empire stopped, all the, all the army was getting drunk, all the generals were drunk. I mean, can you imagine, you know, how quickly Egypt, how quickly Syria, how quickly um, uh, the, the, uh, the various uh, uh, city states in Asia Minor, how quickly they would have revolted against the Persians? I mean, come on, it's a six month party. That would have been over. They would have killed everybody. So obviously that could not have happened. Very interesting. So my father's, yes, my father's explanation is, is an explanation that makes perfect sense. Yes. 
non non mythological no exactly non mythological non mythological so yamim rabim shemonim umat yom okay now what was the purpose of this party the purpose of this party is by the way i'm sorry to interrupt sorry it's not yeah. uncommon for um royalty to do that they have party night and they entertain different guests at different evenings it's not uncommon is in europe today you know anyway just sorry no that's that's an interesting point i think that's an important point and thank you for uh, for, for sharing that so behar oto et osher kevod malchuto now the point of this party was to show off osher kevod malchuto the incredible glorious wealth of his kingdom the et yekar tiferet gedulato and the beauty the beauty of his kingdom because he probably built incredible uh, you know architecture who knows what he built there and what he did so it was on the one hand there was wealth but on the other hand it was very tasteful wealth or maybe we can say not tasteful maybe it was very gaudy for, for our taste right but because he was not a member of the royal family it was very important for him to establish his credentials as a king so the purpose of this party is it's an inaugural ball and during the course of this inaugural ball he is going to establish his credentials i am a king i'm a wealthy king i'm a powerful king and i have amazing taste in art man i don't know what he bought there van gogh monet manet whatever the difference between those two names is and um i'm sure it was a, i'm sure it was a great party i don't doubt it for a second um, but now you understand what the purpose of the party was. All right. Um, let us continue. So the 180-day party finishes, and then he does something a little different. When the, when, when, when the first party, uh, uh, the 180-day party finishes, he now took the people who lived in this fortress, this is a walled city, Shushan Abira. This city in which there was the palace of the king, which was built like a fortress. All the inhabitants of that city were invited to a private party, right? It could have been um, adults. It could have been children. Everybody was invited, men, women, children. Um, we, we know that the Jews were invited. Um, Goyim were invited, um, and the purpose of this party, and I will give you the description in a moment, was to make sure that those within the inner circle of Ahasuerosh are loyal to Ahasuerosh, because by engendering loyalty, he is preventing, um, potentially, a revolution. He is potentially, he is, um, um, preventing potential Ooh. assassins from entering the city because now everybody in the city around him is going to protect him because they loved the king. You understand what this second party is for? So that's what he does in the second party. This second party lasts mishte shivat yamim. This second party lasts for seven days. That's reasonable. That's a reasonable party, a seven day party. You have a week off from work. You know, the king invites you over and it's festivities and banquets um, and, and, you know, cocktail parties. You know, I know that a lot of the politicians, a lot of the media, I'm sorry, the journalists, it's very important for them to be invited to cocktail parties. So one of the reasons that you see such incredible submission um, to a monolithic um, viewpoint, I mean, as you can tell that um, what you, may, you may like this monolithic viewpoint. You're breaking up. You're breaking up. Okay. Okay. No, it's you, fine. Is it better? Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah. Um, so um, one of the things that causes journalists to submit themselves before this monolithic viewpoint that's taking hold of America, and, and as I said, you may actually like this particular viewpoint. That's okay. I'm not, I'm not telling you whether to like this viewpoint or not, that you're free to you know, you're free to like windmills or not like windmills. That's, you know, I have my own opinion. I find it kind of comical, but that's because, you know, that's just the way I am. I find things comical. 
Um, but nevertheless, one of the things that brings about this submission, almost incredible, how everybody's just like standing in line and like everybody's saying the same thing and everybody's writing the same ideas. And if you don't write the same ideas, you know what the great um, punishment is? So in Judaism, this karet, what does karet mean? If a person does an avon in Judaism, you get cut off from olam haba, right? Karet. You not know, just any avon, not just any avon. No, 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 right. No, it has to be a very big avon, right? It has to be like, uh, you know, eating on Yom Kippur. Uh, you know what the great, um, the great karet of these journalists is? Not getting invited to cocktail parties. Meaning, if you start writing the wrong things in your column, they won't invite you to cocktail parties. And that's just unbearable. I mean, that's an unbearable thought. I mean, it's like, why am I spending $500 on this tie? I mean, if I have no one to show it to them, my wife and kids are really not impressed by that, you know? Uh, so I need a cocktail party. And without a cocktail party, what am I going to do? So that's part of the dynamics that's going on here. I mean, it's, it's obviously it's, it's much more. And, and if I was giving a civics course, I, maybe I'll, you know, draw it out a little more. It's not a civics course. I'm explaining the importance of cocktail party in the Gentile world. So this is a seven day cocktail party. Take out your best Versace tie, take out your Armani suit. I mean, this is amazing. Like I, I'm, I'm like, you know, my wife is gonna go shopping. She's gonna get her hair done and, you know, and all that. And this is like, we're going to the King's palace. Wow, that's tempting. Okay, just a little background. So you kind of see where the, what the Jews are going through uh, uh, in, in, this, in this place. Um, okay, so let's, dis let's describe the party a little more. Where did the party take place? We said it took place in Shushan Abira. It took place Bahasar Gnat Bitan Hamelech. I want to explain that. The Haser is a patio. Okay, that's a patio. Then there's, there's the gina. Gina is a garden. I'm, I'm going to explain that in a moment. In Arabic, we say jnene. I don't know, anybody here speak Arabic? Jnene? Jnene means the garden in Arabic. So if anybody was from Hala, from Damasek, they'd all know what that is, what the jnene is. And then there was a bustan. The bustan, the bustan is, the, um, is a place, it's like an orchard where you have beautiful trees. And many of those trees are, are fruit trees. So where did the party take place? There was a, there was a bistan. The bistan is the, um, the bitan, the bitan. In, the, in this pasuk, the word bitan is the bistan. That's a giant orchard. We probably went on for acres and acres and acres. Beautiful trees, beautiful trees. Within, within this giant, orchard, or call it a forest even, whatever, there was a private garden with lovely flowers, right? So that's a section of the orchard. And within this area of beautiful flowers, there was an outdoor patio. So there's an outdoor patio in a garden, which is in a giant orchard. You understand where the party is taking place? So imagine now you're a Jew, you know, you're, you're, um, you were the subject, your parents are the subject of anti-Semitism, right? You, you live in a, I don't know, a small house in Halab. I don't know where, what, I'm making this up. You know, suddenly the king invites you over, you know, not to his orchard and not even to his garden, but to that private patio inside the garden, which is inside the king's orchard. That's where the party is. So it's an incredible, incredible feeling for all, all the people invited to this party, including, um, including the Jews. So that's where the party takes place. So now you have the you have the visual image of the uh, of the party. Okay. Very lucid. Yes. 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 Okay. Now let's continue. Chor karpas utchelet. Now imagine you're in a party, and it's outdoors. It's hot. I mean, well, the sun. You know. So you have these beautiful awnings. You have these beautiful awnings above you. So you outdoors. But above you are these awnings, and the awnings are hur. Hur is white, beautiful white, a special type of linen. Karpas. Karpas is a light green, a light green, like the color of the sky sometimes. Utchelet. Utchelet is a subtle purple, right? So you have these beautiful canopies above you. Of course, you know, any, you know, anybody who has a backyard wants to have a canopy, right, in the summer, right? So there's a beautiful canopies that are that are above 
the people you know, on this patio and the canopies, there are these ropes, linen ropes and beautiful green, light green ropes that are holding the canopies, tying the canopies to these galile chesed, the amuda shesh. They're these pillars of marble, marble pillars. And above the marble pillars, there's galile chesed. There's round silver domes on top of the pillars, right? And there's these ropes that are tying, that are holding the canopy in place through these pillars. You, you see the picture? I hope I'm describing it prop, you know, clearly. Yeah, okay. So you're, <laughs> you enter this garden, you enter this garden and you see these, these beautiful, um, you know, this beautiful place set up for you to sit over where we, we you know, the, so you have a place to sit. Now, the, the seating arrangement was as follows. Mitot zahab b'chesef. The word mitah in modern Hebrew means a bed. But here it actually means a, um, a diwan, right? So the rich people, the aristocracy, when they used to um, sit down to eat and to drink, you, you wouldn't sit on a chair. You would sit, you know, you would have a diwan. It's like a mini sofa kind of, and you would be leaning down like on a pillow on one side, and then people would come to you and serve you, right? They would bring like a tray in front of you, right? This is why in Lel HaSeder, when we drink the wine, we imitate the way the aristocracy used to drink back then, which was reclining to the side. And, um, you know, and, 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 and we do it on Lel HaSeder, we recline to the side. So these are the mitot. Now these mitot, they were made out of gold and silver, meaning the, the frames, the frames, were gold and silver, and on top of that, they had the whatever mattresses and pillows and cushions, whatever they had. So we described the canopies, we described the diwans, and now we're going to describe the floor. The floor was the type of mosaic, and the mosaic floor was made out of um, uh, bahat. Bahat is um, a mother of pearl. Right from the seashells, from the special seashells, um, um, there was um, the, the mosaic was a combination. There was crystal, there was marble, there was sohadet. Sohadet is a reddish type of stone. So there was a beautiful mosaic on the floor. So above you, these beautiful canopies. Right under you, these amazing gold and silver diwans, and on the floor, even where you step. It's a gorgeous mosaic. That's the physical setup for the party. Okay, everybody understand what's happening here? Um, let me give you a more, we, obviously we can continue in the Pesukim, but I wanna give you like a kind of a global bird's eye view of what happens in Megillat Estelle because I think that's also important to understand. So with your permission, I'm now going to switch and and just talk a little about uh, uh, one of the lessons of Megillat Esther. And you know that there is something unprecedented about Megillat Esther. I'm not the first one to say it. Um, I'm sure I'm not going to be the last one to say it. But one of the first people to say it was Rabbi Moshe Al-Mosnino. Rabbi Moshe Al-Mosnino, he points out a, a very unusual fact about Megillat Esther. And that fact is, hold on just one second. All right. Um, the unusual fact about Megillat Esther is as follows. The name of God does not appear at all in the Megillah. That's not usual, right? Usually you have the name of God appearing in all books and in every book of the Bible. Every book of the Tanakh has the name of God as well it should. Um, and this one doesn't. So the Bimo Shal Moslino is one of the first people to point that out. And he asks, why is it that Megillat Esther is the only book where the name of God doesn't appear? How can this even be? I mean, how can it even be? Now, um, uh, furthermore, uh, the thesis of Esther HaMalka, you know, Esther HaMalka, she comes before the rabbis and she wants him to canonize the book. She wants him to canonize Megillat Esther. And the thesis is that it was all the hand of God. It was a miracle. Um, but the story actually seems to disprove that thesis. Um, since if anything, what we see is we see that it was a careful and meticulous planning of Mordechai and Esther uh, that undoes the plan of Haman, not a miracle. It apparently is actually very intelligent leadership that 
uh, brings about um, uh, the redemption. So how was this a miracle? As Esther Hamalka says, and as we believe, we do believe it was a miracle. So that's a good question. So um, I love the answer of Rabbi Moshe Al-Mosnina. I don't know why we don't study these hachamim. I, I just don't know why. I, I can't understand it. Um, it's like this, you know, particular, you know, like, you know, there always has to be vanilla ice cream, chocolate ice cream, strawberry ice cream, that's it. There are no other flavors in the world, right? I mean, but there are actually, um, there's some amazing flavors and, you know, like it's there. Like, don't you want to like experience something new? Okay, that's a side point. Getting back to the point of Rabbi Moshe al um, he says that, you know, when you live in a society, people who live in a society are subject to the values of the society um, they live in. Now, if we look at the values of a society in the past, we may find these values to be ridiculous, and we actually do. Now, let's think about that time. Let's take a time machine and go back to the days of Mordechai, Esther, and let's look at Haman. Haman is an astrologer, um, and he believes in something very important. He believes in fate. He believes in the fact that the universe is a kind of machine, right? So there is this mechanism, there is a machine, and this machine is above us. And we just have to, you know, submit ourselves um, to this machine. There's nothing you can do about um, this machine. Um, this, by the way, this idea of fate um, was um, ubiquitous in antiquity. Oh, everybody believed in uh, fate. The, the ancient Greeks believed that um, many aspects of a person's life um, were determined by three <laughs> mythical women known as, I don't know how they pronounce it in Greek, but as fates, fate, fates, right? Uh, these were three sister goddesses that appeared in Greek and, uh, and by the way, also in uh, Roman mythology. And uh, it was believed that they spun out a child's destiny at birth. This was actual, I know it sounds ridiculous to us, right? But this is what they believed, right? So these fates, they determine when life began, they determine when life ended, and almost everything else um, in between, right? Um, it's not that everything was inflexible. There was a lot of things people did, but a man destined to become a great warrior, right? Would still would become a great warrior. A man destined to kill his father, as in Oedipus Rex, will, will, will kill his uh, father, right? Um, so that's fate. That's the idea of fate. And that's what people believed in. So to determine the fate of the Jewish people, Haman does this astrological ritual. And the purpose of the ritual is not just to determine the fate, but in a sense to strengthen the faith. And he does this ritual and he finds out when are the Jews supposed to be killed? They're they will be killed, but when are they supposed to be killed? In the 13th of the month, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, 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 the month of, uh, one second, somebody just left us and I'm gonna let him back in. Okay, right. Um, uh, the, the, the Haman determined that the Jews will be killed on the 13th day of the month of, of Adar, and, and, he, and in a sense, he seals their fate, but something worse happens. So at the, um, at the religious level, the fate of the Jewish people has been determined. But then he does something worse. He goes to the king, and he convinces the king, Ahasuerus, to legislate the fate of the Jewish people into law. So now it's not just a religious belief, this is what's going to happen to the Jews, but it becomes the law of the land. That on the 13th of Adar, the Jews will be killed. But this is very similar to what the uh, the Nazis did. Um, uh, the Nazis, uh, what they did, I mean, first, it's interesting, by the way, I think it was 1938, I don't remember what the exact date was. Um, uh, there was November X, I, I, I could be off on the date. It was 1938, but, um, or, so, so there was one day he said, all Jews have to give over their weapons. No more owning arms, all weapons, all guns, 
all rifles, everything had to be given to the police. Anybody caught with weapons will be um, punished uh, severely. And then the next day, the order came out that the mobs, the regular mobs should go and attack Jewish houses, should attack Jewish uh, synagogues, and the police were ordered not to um, interfere. That is learned from Megillat Esther. The idea of Haman was that the mobs that hate the Jews would attack the Jewish people and plunder their wealth, right? So that's where the Nazis got that idea from. Um, the only thing that the Nazis added was gun control because in the days of the Nazis, there was guns. So they said, let's first confiscate all the guns. They had no second amendment in, in Germany or maybe they did, who cares? I mean, like they're like they, the Germans did whatever the heck they wanted, I guess at the end of the day. Um, but the bottom line is they confiscated the guns and then the next day they, they gave the order to, um, to kill the Jews. So there's something special about the law that Achashverosh passes and it is as follows. This is a law that was gonna be sealed and was sealed with the ring of the king. And the law was that um, the rule or the way this, the way this the legal system worked is that if the king seals a law with his signet, it is irrevocable. Even the king himself cannot undo that law. So look what's happening here. We have the faith at the mystical astrological level and now we have the law to back up the fate. So that is, that's it. I mean, it's like, if you were a Jew living in that, um, if you were a Jew living in the days of Ahasuerus, you're like, it's, uh, geez, like it's, it's, it's over. I mean, yeah, what am I gonna do? It's over, right? At the religious level, at the legal level, we're, we're, we're done for it. So here's, here's the miracle. This is what Rabbi Moshe Al-Mosnino says. Rabbi Moshe Al-Mosnino points out that the miracle of Purim was that the Jewish people did not submit to the values and beliefs of the Persian society they lived in. Had the Jews believed in the uh, astrological ideas of faith and the Greek ideas of faith, then they would have just surrendered to their destiny, right? You might as well just surrender and accept the. Uh, that this is your this is your fate, and you, there's no point in fighting fate. And and this happened many times when you know, one nation conquered another, and uh, the the loser would just submit completely to the victor because there was nothing to do. So according to the values of the society, they should have surrendered. Why fight it? So the miracle was that the Jews stood up and said, "No, we do not believe in fate." And they did everything they can against incredible odds, against impossible odds, to stop what the Persians called fate. So once the Jews acted miraculously, and they acted miraculously, they set up all the pieces, Mordechai, Esther, the various actions that they took, right? Once they did that, Hashem was behind the scenes, as he always is, ensuring that the plan of the Jews is a successful plan. Because a lot of times you make incredible efforts and you do everything as you should do it and you still end up losing, right? So the lesson of Purim is, is a couple of lessons, but one of the lessons is, yes, we need to be intelligent. Yes, we need to fight for our rights to exist as a Jewish people. And we have to be smart about it. We can't be stupid. We can't just, oh, it'll be okay. Uh, you know, uh, it always amazes me how, you know, there's this idea among some groups in Israel, not, not all, but there are some groups in Israel among the ultra-Orthodox that, you know, you know, we are, you know, we're studying Torah and the Yeshiva. So, you know, we're the ones who are protecting, we're the ones who are protecting Israel, not the soldiers, not the soldiers who are actually going and doing their stuff. We're protecting Israel. The ones in the, ones in the yeshiva, we're the ones who are protecting Israel. And like, you know, my answer, if anybody, nobody bothered to ask me, but if they asked me, I would say, how well did that go for you in uh, World War II? Uh, they had a lot of yeshivot then. Right? Right. So didn't seem to work, did it? Huh. Okay. 
So I think the lesson of Megillah of Purim is no, <laughs> studying Torah is not going to save you from a hashvah. Studying Torah is the most important thing a person can do in his life. Don't get me wrong. But if there's a crisis, you better deal with the crisis and you better deal with it in a smart way because if you're not smart, you're going to lose. So, so Rabbi, I have a question. Yeah. The story of Purim is centered around two individuals primarily. It's not centered around the whole Jewish people as going and fighting this decree. It, it, it focuses more on just Esther and Mordechai, right? Or like, I don't, until after the fact, when you, at the end, it has all the Jewish people went and they did and they destroyed their enemies and they did everything at the end. But the actual story of saving the Jews, it's focused on two individuals. So you don't see that community wide resistance, which I'm sure was there, but I mean, and maybe I'm missing something, but I don't see it in that storyline. Yeah, um, so so it was the first, um, when so, Haman, yeah. So when, when he asked them to fast for her, they do it. So you see the community rallying behind her. They right. needed to make the decisions, but they were, it's not like they ignored her and they said, no, there's nothing wrong. They, they fought, they, they, they did their part. They right. prayed for her, they, they fasted. So I, I, I agree that they're the main characters, but I think most of the people rallied behind her. Right, let me, let me, uh, right, and you're a joy. Uh, what you said is correct. And Danny, let me explain to you because it's a little subtle. Um, it was the 13th day of Nisan that the decree went out from Ahasuerus or from Amman to destroy the Jewish people already that day. Mordechai organizes the Jewish community. Already that day, the Jewish community institutes a fast and they go out in the streets of Shushan, the Jewish community at the instruction of Mordechai. Of course, we had an intelligent leader, but we were also intelligent enough to right. appoint this leader and then to follow the instructions of the leader. And right, you have to have a leader. Right. right. And for three days, the Jewish community fasted. By the way, do you know that this fast came out on Pesach? There was no Pesach that year because they were fasting. I mean, just think of that. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible event. There was no Masa, there was no Marol, there was, you know, they were, they were singing Adona Selichot instead of Ava, the Imayinu Lefarov, the Misraim, they were singing Adona Selichot. And that's what they were doing. I mean, think of that. It's, 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 it's incredible. So it was, so it, 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 the story is about Mordechai and Esther, but there would be no Mordechai and Esther without the Jewish community there doing what the smart leader told them to do. And they were smart for appointing a smart leader, right? So, so it goes both ways. And that's really important. That is an important um, message of putting, I mean, it's 9.30 now, but I, there was a few other things I wanted to say. And it's good that you asked those questions because I like these questions, they're good. Um, but I just want to say that as Jews in exile, there's always going to be this conflict. You know, in the case of Persia, it was believe in faith, believe in astrology submit to fate and the mm. Torah says no the Torah says it's a God and God rules us according to what we deserve and and if we could improve our our ways and improve our, ourselves in the eyes of God then yeah we will get a we will get rewarded and and, and the Gezerah would be mitpatelet so there's always that tension right so part of the challenge of being in the Galut says man you know when you're here in Brooklyn wherever you are in, in America where out in Israel you feel God in Israel you really feel God it's beautiful you don't feel God here, right? That's Megillat Esther. You don't see the name of God anywhere. It's like almost not there. But if you're smart and you reject the phony ideas of the Goyim, whatever those ideas are, you know, we can always, we can have another discussion about that. And you're intelligent, you act intelligently, you can survive the worst situations. You can survive uh, Haman, who was a type of Hitler. And not only you can survive him, but you can eradicate him. So that's the beauty of Purim. The beauty of Purim is here is a case in Jewish history where we did it right. We did what we're supposed to do and Hashem helped us and there was light. The most beautiful pasuk is la Yehudim hayata ora besimcha. There was a light, there was a joy, right? Usually this type of light is reserved for the land of Israel. But here there was a light outside the land of Israel for the Jewish people. That's what happens when we follow the ways of the Torah and act as smart people should act. That's a basic lesson. So I don't know if there's any questions. It's a little late, but if there are, I'll you know, take them anyway. Yeah, but can I uh, ask something? Yeah. Can you clarify, you, you're saying that we're supposed to be smart. 
But what they did do was they basically prayed to Hashem, they fasted, and she made an effort to plead with Achashverosh. Like, I mean, do we consider that smart or do we say that was, uh, you know, from Hashem? We, we did our part. And right. So maybe next year I'll get into the plan more clearly. It was a really <laughs> smart, well thought out plan. I'm telling you, Esther Amalka put on whatever makeup she could put on when she came to Ahasuerus, but Tilbash Esther Malchut, and she did whatever she can do, and she was conniving and shrewd, and she really was conniving and shrewd, one party after another party, driving her husband crazy, like, what is going on here, right? There's a whole plan here. It was like a well-thought-out chess game. They were really smart the way they did this, but maybe next year we'll get into that, uh, a little more into that. This year, I think we're... Uh, we're out of time. Uh, next next week is Megillat Esther, so there's no stunning Torah the night of Megillat Esther, at least at this hour. So let me wish you all uh, Shabbat Shalom, Purim Sameach, and Sheikuyam Anu Hapasuk La Yehudim Hayata Ora Besimcha. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you.